If you dream of crossing huge distances on a motorcycle at high speeds, in luxurious comfort and with very little stress, it really doesn't get much better than with these sort of motorcycles. In fact, the four big ADVs we have here are so incredibly capable that we just had to put them through a multi-day ride from Delhi to Mumbai while exploring the beauty of Rajasthan. This is going to be a lot of fun. The four bikes we have here are at the top of the adventure bike food chain. The Harley Davidson Pan America 1250 Special, the Triumph Tiger 1200 GT Pro and the Ducati Multistrada V4S are all completely new motorcycles and every one of them has one goal – to beat the market supremacy of the BMW R1250 GS. How capable they are of actually doing this is something we're going to discover over this journey. But the first step was all about escaping the chaos of Delhi in exchange for the beauty of Rajasthan. There really wasn't much to this first leg apart from dealing with miserable traffic and plenty of heat. But there's always a silver lining and in this case, it gave Rishabh, Soham, Zaran and myself a great first impression of just how well these bikes were going to handle our journey ahead. Since these bikes are all about immense capability with incredible comfort, let's start talking about the comfort factor. Every bike here is supremely comfortable with spacious seats, upright riding positions and extensive wind protection. Now these are all things that you also get on super-sized cruiser motorcycles, but these ADVs have the crucial advantage of generous suspension travel and the ability to breeze through the worst that our Indian road systems can throw at them. In fact, every bike here has electronically controlled suspension and they can all automatically adapt to the road condition in real time, which is a fantastic luxury to have. Now it's quite obvious that these are huge motorcycles with very spacious riding positions and they all seat you in a neutral, comfortable, upright position. But when you spend so many hours on the road, there are a few nuances that you start to notice. Some of these are just nuances, some of them are irritants. Let's start with the Tiger. This bike has a very comfortable, neutral riding position. The foot pegs are nicely placed beneath you, not too high up, not too far down low. Reach to the handlebar, also very nice. The only quirk we noticed is that some of us found that the bend in the handlebar puts your wrists at a slight angle. Wasn't really a problem, just something we noticed. Then we come to the Harley Davidson. Now this is the quirkiest of the lot. It really does feel like Harley has tried to bring in some of their cruiser philosophy into not just the look of the bike, but also how it feels underneath you. Look at the length of this fuel tank. It's really long and it's quite unique. The foot peg position is a little higher than the Tiger. Not really a problem, but this is what really stood out to us. It's a very long reach to the handlebar. That's something that you start to feel in your shoulders after a few hours on the road. Now, Harley says that they will sell you a different handlebar or different risers, but it's something you should know. The Multistrada V4, meanwhile, still very much a Multistrada in the way it seats you. Unlike the other bikes, it feels like you're sitting in the bike rather than on it, and the seat height position reflects that. At 840mm, this is the lowest of the lot. Now, there are advantages and disadvantages to how you sit on the multi. On the road, this feels really enclosed, sporty, and even the foot peg position is high up, but it's not extreme. You can spend many hours in this riding position. But off-road, you're sort of sitting low, you don't have that commanding line of sight. So, it's a give and take. And that brings us to the last bike here, the BMW 1250GS. Now, this one was unanimously the most natural and comfortable feeling of the lot for all four of us, and we are differently shaped riders. Everything about this bike is neutral, well-judged and just comfortable. The same goes for the wind protection. Every bike here has great wind protection, but some of them have more buffeting than the others and the GS just seems to strike the nicest balance of a lot. We also really like this windscreen that's finely adjustable to suit exactly what you need. Perhaps the most appealing thing about these huge machines is how little work you have to do out on the highway. Now we've already established how comfortable and isolated from the wind they are, 
But another big attraction is the incredible power available at any given time. Collectively, these four bikes produce over 600 horsepower and every one of them is capable of being violently quick, although the multi takes it to another level. Nevertheless, every single one of these bikes can blast past 170 just like that. Or you can hold a relaxed high-speed cruise. And that's the beauty of having such big engines. It's not about crazy top speeds. And no matter the speed or the gear, you can just open the throttle and the bike just goes. With 136 horsepower, the GS is the least powerful here, but it also happens to produce the most torque and at lower revs than anything else. Now, it's an easy mistake to think that this is some sort of an uncle motorcycle meant for gentle and reserved riding. You will immediately drop that idea the moment you twist the throttle open, because the GS is the most responsive bike here at low revs and at normal riding speeds. In fact, it's got so much torque that it can catch you out if you're not respectful with the throttle. It goes without saying that respect is an absolute must when you ride the 170 horsepower Multistrada V4. The new four-cylinder Multistrada is easily the fastest bike here, but its performance is very different to the GS, where you can comfortably spend all day long below 5000 RPM. To be fair, the new V4 is pleasantly well-behaved at low revs with none of the jerky, lurchy behaviour of the old L-twin engines. Still, you get the sense that while the Multi-V4 will tolerate low revs, it would much rather be spinning its engine up, because the real fun exists above 6000 RPM. Despite that huge power figure, the new V4 engine has a huge 60,000 km interval between the expensive valve clearance services, which addresses one of the major issues people have with Ducati ownership. As for the Tiger and the Harley, both of them make 150 horsepower, and both are seriously quick machines. Interestingly, the Tiger has the nicer low and mid-range feel, while the Harley is very happy to rev high and dish out its power. The Tiger 1200 produces a deep growl from its exhaust that's just like the Tiger 900 and this is a sound that I've actually grown to enjoy. Meanwhile, the liquid-cooled Harley-Davidson sounds nothing like the brand's big cruisers and this engine has a thrummy, quick revving feel to it. The Tiger and the Ducati have the nicest bi-directional quick shifters, while the GS's shifter takes a little more effort than we'd like. Still, that's better than the Pan America which doesn't have a quick shifter at all, even as an accessory and that's something that you really miss out in this company. As for refinement, none of them have any nasty vibrations, but the GS comes across as the smoothest motor while also transmitting plenty of feel and character back to the rider. Now all four engines here are exciting and impressive, but two of them stand out as extra special. The Multi's newfound low-end smoothness and capability, along with its super bike-like surge above 6000 RPM, is really quite astonishing. And then there's the GS. Everything about this engine, from its refinement, sound, tractability, fueling, clutch feel, it all comes across as quite special. It really feels like BMW has spent years perfecting this formula, which they effectively have. Now, all four of us are connected via helmet intercom. And every time someone new hops on the GS, you invariably hear something like, man, what a great engine this is. When it comes to fuel range, the Multi has the largest tank, but it also drains its 22-litre tank the fastest. If you're very disciplined with the throttle, you should be able to squeeze out a range of about 300 kilometers. But if you ride this bike the way it loves to be ridden, that number can drop by half. On the other hand, the Pan Am always went the longest distance, no matter the riding conditions, and the GS was always second. The Tiger's range was nearly the same as the Ducati, but it has a smaller 20-litre fuel tank. Like the BMW, the Tiger also comes with a long-range variant that has a huge 30-litre fuel tank and a few more features. Of course, with that advantage comes the compromise of plenty of added weight and bulk. As for fuel requirements, the Ducati is the only one that demands high-octane fuel, but all these engines run happier on the good stuff. So we fed them with either HP Power 99 or Power 100 high-octane fuel along the way.
Now with bikes that can chew through the miles this well, it's possible to cover the entire journey from Delhi to Mumbai in one shot if you're crazy committed and it can easily be done in two days. But we decided to take in more of Rajasthan along the way, especially since the roads around Jodhpur are some of the best you'll find in the country. We're now at Jawai Band in Rajasthan and as you can see the geography around us is simply stunning. The roads on the way here have been fabulous as well and after hours of long straight highways, we finally had a few corners and some light off-roading to play around with. We've already talked about how every bike here has electronic suspension and in the case of the Tiger and the Ducati, that suspension is quite customizable. Yet, the overall ride comfort on each bike is a little different. The GS feels the most soft and floaty of the lot, and while it does firm up decently in dynamic mode, it never feels highly sporty. As has clearly become the theme, the Multistrada is on the other end of the spectrum, and it is clearly the most firm bike here, although even the Multi deals with broken roads quite well. The Harley and the Tiger find a nice middle ground, and they both do the best job of absorbing bigger bumps. Ultimately, the Tiger does seem to have the nicest setup when it comes to a balance of comfort and control. Handling-wise, the Multi will get your pulse racing the highest, and even though there aren't superbike levels of feel from the front end, it's still the sharpest, most exciting motorcycle here. The Tiger is a natural and easy machine in the corners, but it is held back by its comfortable foot pegs that are the first to scrape the road when the lean angles increase. The Pan America, meanwhile, continues to destroy any preconceived notions of what a Harley can be, because this is a genuinely fun handler. In this company, the Pan Am feels like the longest and heaviest bike, which it is, but if you put in the work, it will reward you in the corners. As for the GS, the key word when it comes to handling is easy. With its light steering and low center of gravity, the GS takes the least effort to hustle through some corners. In fact, where the Multi gets you all worked up into a sporty state of mind where you're hanging off the bike to maximize speed, the rider on the GS can just sit comfortably in place and carry a pretty similar level of pace. The one thing on the GS that does need a little more effort than we'd like are the brakes. It slows down well enough, but the lever needs a bit of a pull and the same applies to the Harley-Davidson. The Multistrada, meanwhile, has very good brakes, but it's actually the Tiger that has the sharpest and most powerful brakes here. Once again, the Multi and the GS feel like the lightest, easiest and most agile bikes here. Now with the Multi, that sort of makes sense because this is the lightest motorcycle on paper. But with the GS, it comes down to pure physics and some very out-of-the-box engineering. If you take a look at a naked GS chassis, you'll see just how unique this concept is. Everything is centered around the boxer engine, and the biggest part of the chassis is actually the huge rear section that includes the subframe. Up front, there's a small element that connects the steering headstock and BMW's unique deli lever front suspension. This is basically a front monoshock that works along with the telescopic fork. The more commonly known effect of the telelever suspension is that the dive under braking is quite limited. But what I find more impressive is just how light it makes the handlebar feel, because BMW only needed to use a skinny 37mm fork here. Couple that with the low slung weight of the engine, the superb bottom end torque, the smooth throttle response, and the fact that the GS has the lightest clutch, and you have a formula that most conventional motorcycles will struggle to beat. Now the reason we're telling you all this is because it explains why the GS is by far the easiest bike to ride here in pretty much every condition, be it slow city traffic, out on the highway or off-road. The only real downside to all this is in managing how far that engine sticks out. You've got to be careful of the sheer width of the engine while manoeuvring through heavy traffic and the same applies while riding through deep ruts or tight and tricky situations off-road. Now, all four bikes here come with 19-inch front wheels and a couple of them are actually on alloy wheels. So the spec sheet warriors out there are bound to say that these motorcycles are just posers when it comes to off-road riding. But as is usually the case, they're wrong. 
the biggest surprise is the sporty Multistrada. Compared with the previous model that had a 17-inch front wheel, this bike feels a lot more natural and comfortable off-road with its 19-inch front. The standing-up ergonomics are still the most road-oriented and the suspension has the least amount of travel here. But the suspension has much more compliance than before and with the engine's smoother low-speed power delivery, this non-enduro Multistrada now really doesn't mind playing around in the dirt. As for the Harley, it once again feels the biggest and heaviest bike here and it needs the most work. But the bike has a lot of capability built in and it can really take a beating. The top special variant of the Pan Am that we have here is the only bike with crash bars as standard and this is something you definitely want to option as an extra on the other three. We uh, tested the bars on these bikes a few times and they kept the motorcycles completely free from harm. Dropping your motorcycle is all part of the game when riding such big things off-road, so it really is worthwhile to invest in some good protection. Meanwhile, the GS is just as effortless and capable off-road as it is on it. The balanced, light feel makes you feel very comfortable and confident in your own abilities, and this is the easiest bike to manage in technical, slow-speed situations. When you start demanding a bit more, the GS also has the composure and suspension travel to play along. Although in hindsight, I probably wouldn't have fooled around so close to the water if I knew what was floating just a few feet away. Anyway, it's also worth mentioning that this is the easiest bike to pick up thanks to the low center of mass and the fact that that engine doesn't let the bike fully fall over. While the Tiger doesn't feel quite as easy as the GS, it has all the right ingredients, including good standing up ergonomics and the most suspension travel here with 200mm at both ends. With more off-road focused tyres, even this GT version will be quite capable off-road, but it did have a tendency to stall unexpectedly and that certainly robs you of confidence. Nevertheless, the Tiger has the nicest bottom end performance after the GS and it produces very little heat for the rider to bear. Now this isn't something we usually discuss in our reviews, but I'd like to talk about the radiator design on these three motorcycles. They all have side-mounted split radiators that carefully duck the hot air away from the rider. The result is that they can get warm at worst, but they never get uncomfortably hot, even the Ducati. Now that is something that's very valuable to have, and unfortunately, the same can't be said for the Pan Am. The moment the speeds come down, the Pan Am really starts to cook its rider with a heavy blast of hot air coming from the left and plenty of heat radiating off the header pipes on the right. Another downside is that the central one-piece radiator is a little low slung and it can easily get clogged with dirt thrown off the front wheel. Thankfully, the Pan Am makes up for this with an excellent feature set, including one really clever and unique feature that we will get to in a bit. Clearly, these machines are the motorcycling equivalent of a luxury super SUV and as you'd expect, they're absolutely stuffed to the gills with features and equipment and every one of them has something unique to offer. All of them have the basics that you would expect, including big TFT displays, plenty of riding modes and rider assists. The Multistrada 6.5-inch TFT is inspired by Ducati's sports bikes, while the GS screen is typical BMW, as in it's well-designed, clear and easy to read. The Tiger has arguably the nicest looking display here, but it takes an age to boot up and the animations could be smoother. In comparison, the Harley's display has no fancy animations and some of the information is quite small. The Pan Am's controls also feel quite old-school, with a huge number of switches on both sides. As far as switch gear goes, the GS and the Multistrada were the nicest to use. One feature that will mean a lot to some customers is the drive shaft. The GS and Tiger both have shaft drive systems, whereas the Multi and Pan Am will demand regular chain maintenance. The Multistrada V4S stands out with its radar-based adaptive cruise control and blind spot warning system, although both of them are a bit too sensitive for our chaotic roads. The Pan America we had came with Harley's optional adaptive ride height system, which is a very clever feature. Essentially, this system drops the rear shock by 1 to 2 inches depending on the riding mode that you're in when you come to a standstill. It works very smoothly and it's a valuable feature for short riders. 
All these features went a long way in keeping us comfortable, especially on the last day from Ahmedabad to Mumbai when the roads were at their worst. The long and relatively boring ride home was also a great time to reflect on the prices of these bikes and the value that they have to offer. As you can see, the well-equipped Tiger 1200 GT Pro is the best priced bike here. For one lakh more, you can also have the Tiger 1200 Rally Pro with its 21-inch front wheel and extra suspension travel. That motorcycle is definitely more off-road capable than anything we have here, but it's also a taller bike that isn't as easy to ride. The GS is the second most affordable bike, even in the spec that we have here which comes with spoke trims and that cool looking style rally paint scheme. Surprisingly, the Pan America Special costs even more than the GS when you spec it with the optional spoked wheels and the adaptive ride height. And that high price does the Harley no favours in this company. Only the Multistrada V4S costs more, but that's the price you have to pay for all that speed and Italian Exotica. I think the best way to conclude this is to tell you what each of us thinks is the best motorcycle here because we're all effectively different sort of riders. Soham over there is the most inexperienced of this group in terms of riding such big bikes. He's never spent time on such big motorcycles. Zaran is our in-house racer boy and at 5'8", he is the shortest person here although at 5'8", he's not really that short. And then we have Rishabh. Rishabh loves all motorcycles, he loves adventure bikes, but he doesn't really like riding off-road. So I think he's going to give us a different perspective. With that out of the way, we're going to ask everyone one simple question. Which is the best bike here, Soham? So having ridden them across all these days, there are a few things I like about all of them. But for me personally, it has to be the GS. I just love everything about it. From someone who has never ridden such bikes like this before, it was intimidating at first, but from the moment I hopped onto it, the light controls, how well balanced it is, and the low end grunt just make it so easy to ride and so approachable. And not to mention, I just love the way this thing looks. So this one is the one for me. All right, Zaran, something different? Um, not really, because for someone of my build and experience bank, this segment is perhaps one of the most intimidating of them all, and the GS makes it effortless. Uh, like no other bike here can. Within five minutes of jumping on it, you feel like you could cross continents and I think that's why it's the best bike here. Okay. Rishabh. <laughs> well, I have to agree the GS is a great all-rounder and all other bikes are very good in their own ways. But this really speaks to my heart. I really, really, really love this motorcycle for its engine, its handling, uh, the suspension and it just, it just speaks to me. I like a sporty adventure bike. I'm more of a tarmac guy. This is the kind of motorcycle I would happily put my money on. Okay, uh, so they all seem to have picked just two motorcycles, so I'm going to talk about every one of them. We'll start with the Harley Davidson. For a first effort in a segment that the company has zero experience in, I think Harley has done a phenomenal job. When we rode that bike in isolation, it was really impressive in almost every parameter. But in this group, it's up against rivals that have decades of experience and have really perfected their motorcycles to a large degree. The Pan Am does have a few shortcomings. It feels like the biggest and heaviest motorcycle here. It's quite long, it takes effort to ride, it produces a lot of heat. But if you are able to ignore all those things, there is a lot of capability in that bike in all situations. Fast highway work, corners, off-road, it can really do it all. It's very capable. Then, the Triumph Tiger. This motorcycle, Triumph has been quite clear from the very beginning. They built this bike benchmarking the GS. They want to beat the GS. And in many ways, it is the most similar bike to the GS here. It has the best low and mid-range performance here after the GS and it's also a really nice all-rounder. Fantastic highway machine, capable off-road and it's an easy bike to ride. However, there are a few issues. That display is quite laggy and like all Triumphs, the traction control system is over-intrusive and sometimes you could just be riding on a gravel road and it completely robs you of power. Moreover, this bike was the one that had the biggest tendency to unpredictably stall at low RPMs. And when you do stall it, this power switch is quite hard knit. It takes some effort to start the bike back up. So these small niggles sort of bring the Tiger down a little bit, but it's still the value for money package here. And then we have the Multistrada. That bike is effectively a superbike retirement program. If you're done with superbikes, you don't want to deal with them in our road conditions. You want something really fast, but very comfortable you cannot beat that motorcycle. It's insane the performance it has. In fact, I sometimes wonder, do I really need 170 horsepower in my motorcycle? But then it's also really usable. What Ducati has done with the Multistrada V4 compared to the V2 is amazing. 
especially with how good this thing is off road i would never really want to take an old v2 multi strader off road but i enjoyed riding that bike even if the off road riding position has the handlebar a little too low and the power delivery isn't as gentle and friendly as the gs it's still really capable amazing all rounder but it's the bike to go for if you prioritize sportiness and that brings us to the gs and like my colleagues over here i believe this is the best motorcycle and by some margin yes it's very easy to ride but it's also really involving it is such a charming motorcycle you cannot get tired of it we've been on the road for about 2000 kilometers now it's been 5 days it's been exhausting 14 15 hours of shooting a day and if you were to ask me i'd hop on that bike and ride all the way down to kanyakumari that's how involving it is it's a great package very few motorcycles come to being as good as this is in fact there is no possibility of the perfect motorcycle but i don't think anything else comes as close to it as the bmw 1250 gs so there you have it after 2000 kilometers through all sorts of conditions we have a clear winner all hail the bmw r1250 gs the undisputed king of the land You can finish PTC two. PTC two. It doesn't matter, that does it? PTC two, you know? Just say it. Okay. PTC two. For the sake of Sudesh. PTC two. Sudesh, this is all for you. Special treat. Okay. I'm doing a movie that did it. Sorry, Mohit. <laughs> Take number six thousand seven hundred and forty-two. Are we good to go? Yeah, what a good leap! Oh, 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 video, you know, yeah. Oh, the three people here. <laughs> Did you realize Bhaskar was at the back? <laughs>